Hi, Robert. I saw you, but I couldn't get my chair turned around. Oh my God. I lost my seat. I know. I lost my Diane, are you ready? Okay, let's call to order the April 6, 2022, Historic Preservation Board meeting. And call the roll, please. Kristen Finn. Here. Robert Ostinoff. Here. Elise Lindstrom. Absent. Rhonda Saxon. Present. Jim Chard. Here. Claudia Willis. Here. Benjamin Baffer. Here. Hey, do we have any changes to the agenda? We do. Item 8A which is a COA waiver and variance for 231 Venetian Drive. The applicant has submitted a postponement request to um, request to be postponed to the June 1st meeting. So with the notices and all of that, it would need to be a date certain um, postponement for that item. So we'll ask that that be removed. We need a motion to make that change. You just need to move to approve the amended agenda. Do you need a motion for it yes. to be to the date, sir? We do. Yes. Okay, well, let's get to the item then, actually. Okay. And then we'll just do that motion during that item. I should have mentioned that earlier. I didn't think of that. That's okay. We still need a motion for the agenda. Yes. Correct. Make a motion that we approve the amended gen agenda. Eliminating. So, sorry, we're actually not going to amend it because it was we're um, <clears throat> we're going to get to the item and then do the motion for postponement. Just because I didn't realize it needed a date certain. So, if you just do, if if you're good with the agenda, just motion to approve the regular agenda. I move we approve the agenda. Second. Kristen Finn. Yes. Robert Ostoff? Yes. Ron Saxon? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Buddy Willis? Yes. And Jimmy Baffer? Yes. All right, so we do have minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Well, there are two sets. Do we approve them separately or not? You can approve them both at the same time. Just make sure to say both of them in the motion, please. Okay, I make a motion to approve the August 4th, 2021 mi minutes, as well as the September 1, 2021 minutes. Kristen Finn? Yes. Robert Ostinoff? Yes. Rhonda Saxton? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Buddy Willis? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. All right, let's swear in anyone from the public who wishes to speak. <laughs> Ms. Richard, right hand by the authority vested in me, the notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Do we have any comments from the public not related to the quasi-judicial items on the agenda? Seeing none, do we have any presentations? Okay. All right, so we do have a presentation. It's in relation to the Seaboard Airline Railway Station, which is located at 80 Depot Avenue. This is an unsafe structure report. Our chief building official is here and will give a Summary to you, you'll see that in your agenda packet there was information in a memo and photographs. We also have um, staff from Public Works here, should there be any further questions as well. So I'll introduce Steve Tobias, our chief building official. Good evening, Steve Tobias for Development Services. 
The item before the board is an update on the unsafe building report regarding the Seaboard Airline Railway Station located at 80 Depot Avenue per LDR Section 451 and LDR Chapter 7.8. A little bit of background, you may remember this. The uh, Seaboard Airline Railway was designed by renowned architect Gustav Maas and constructed in 1927. The property was listed on the National Registry of Historic Places in 86, the local registry of, place of historic places in 88. Uh, the local architect, Rick Brodigan, who was a train enthusiast, um, had, was one time owner of this property. Um, you may know him as a designer of some Art Deco properties here throughout town. Um, Mr. Brodigan passed away in 2021, early 2021. The property is located northeast intersection of 95, Interstate 95 and West Atlantic Avenue in Delray Beach. The original vehicular access was from West Atlantic. That was closed and the entrance now is off of uh, Lake Ida Road. <clears throat> uh, railway activity ceased on the property in about 1995. And um, it was purchased by the city in 2005. February 25th, 2020, uh, shortly after we came to the board with some information on this, a fire consumed the building, uh, which was a result of arson. The fire destroyed the entire interior of the building as well as the roof, windows, doors. Uh, the building was determined to be unsafe at that point. Pursuant LDR section 4.51G, and pursuant LDR 782, we use the definition of for unsafe whenever a building, structure, or portion thereof is damaged by fire, flood, earthquake, wind, or other to the extent that the structural integrity of the building or structure is less than it was prior to the damage, um, it must meet the standard building code for a new building. So this is what we use to make the building and deem it unsafe. Mr. Richard Heisenbottle, architect for the project, uh, provided this narrative. Um, I'm going to read it. It is during the course of selective demolition at the Seaboard Airway Railroad Station project, crews encountered a minor structural collapse of the front porcachere area of the building. As the floor slab was removed, a small section, one column collapsed down approximately three inches and therefore causing the areas of the porcachere structure to creak. This was an area that been, had been intended to remain and be restored, um, but now needs to be completely reconstructed. He also goes on to state, I believe the collapse was caused by inadequate structural design of the original footer, columns, and arches. The replacement columns and arches will be constructed of concrete and stucco to match the original building dimensions and profiles. Based upon the above, the portion of the building that was uh, the structure that was originally intended to retain and retained to restore must now be demolished and reconstructed. The plan for the design will fundamentally be fundamentally identical to the original plan and the structure for being reconstructed. All requirements of the LDR's comprehensive plans and the city historic preservation design guidelines and the secretary's interior standards will be met. We have representatives here from, um, from the Public Works Department, as well as I can answer any questions you may have about the structure and how it's unsafe. So these pictures were taken showing some of the foundation that looks like it's undermined and causing that, um, as Mr. Heisenbottle stated, to creak. Um, the cracking, the uh, inferior foundation um, causes this, and as they start digging out, they realize that there was more structural damage. So these would need to be replaced. And that concludes that. Any questions? I have a question. I'm not a structural engineer, and I may be showing my ignorance, but uh, is the roof part going to be able to be saved? Is, or is it just these columns that are going to be replaced? According to Mr. Heisenbottom, we will ask um, the folks, the representatives from Public Works. Um, it looks like just the columns will need to be replaced. They'll be able to save and shore up, obviously, what's there. It looks like they're using pole jacks to make sure that there's no deflection in the roof. Okay, thank you. 
Very good. Very good. I'm sorry. We'll clarify that for you. Okay. Oh, okay. no, no, I don't need that. Good evening, Kevin Matthews, Project Manager, Public Works. Um, the the original site plan that was approved, or the it called for the replacement of the the roof, the entire roof, but that entire front portion will come down. The Porter Cashier roof and columns and everything. Okay, as as the original reconstruction or renovation plans. What's that? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. It's, it's no, so that, that was coming down anyway. Right. Well, the roof. The roof is brand new for the entire building. Okay. Could you clarify your question, Miss Willis? <laughs> I, I just, we were seeing cracks in the columns and the support walls, and I see that they have put structures to keep it upright. I just wondered uh, when they repaired this the new part they're going to do if they were keeping the old original roof above it. But as I understand, the plans already said they're replacing the roof. So the, um, the plans for the building included saving the structure, replacing the roof. Yes. Now the whole thing has to be Got replaced. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to be sure. I had a question for, I don't know who, Mr. Tobias or the uh, Public Works. Have you found the original plans from this building? Has anybody looked at that? I'm just curious to whether or not this Porter Cacher was part of the original structure or not. I cannot speak for that. Um. It was included on the original plans. Um, we don't have structural and art, you know, details like that, but we have the architectural drawings. Um, sands the structural and it was included in the original design of the building it, it almost in the photos mm -hmm. it almost looks like those columns are sitting on the slab rather than on a foundation which is why if they were demoing the slab that that would maybe cause those columns to to fall like that mm -hmm. but I, I can't imagine that would ever be the original design yeah, that's how it would be a I would be a guess if I was to tell you that the slab was there originally I'd have to go back and check um, the original plans I don't remember if the slab was there who is the owner of this building now is it the city the city the city uh, I know that there are plans for you know the renovation and reconstruction is that imminent or is it going to be some time before the it's progressing work, so the they they do now? What happened here was the, they have the demolition, um, interior demolition, and that they started working on the site because it's unsafe. They needed to get the building in a condition where they could work on it. Um, the application for the permit, has it been submitted? Yes. It's been submitted. We've certified the site plan. So it's, it's moving along, um, and we expect permit issuance to be happening as soon as all the comments are addressed. My, my question would be, what's, uh, what measures are being taken to prevent further damage or additional damage? You know, it's, we're, we're losing the portica share, which is bad, but, um, you know, what, what can we do as the city or as a custodian of this building to you know, ensure that when they start demolition in, say, the main portion, that we don't find that you know more more of this building starts to, to fall apart and become structurally unstable. So Mr. Matthews can speak more to this, um, but I would like to state that Mr. Richard Heisenbottel, who is the architect, is a historic architecture professional and has worked on other buildings throughout the state of Florida. He's highly revered in his field, and his plans have included a complete shoring of the entire structure um, for the, the portions of the building that's to be rehabilitated or fixed basically following the burn so that the demolition of the structure the portions of the structure because you'll remember the back half was approved for demolition mm -hmm. so that that activity doesn't affect the structural integrity of the front so there are plans but as I'm sure he would tell you if he was standing here it's hard to foresee what's going to happen in the field, especially with a building that's been compromised by fire. So there, there are a complete set of plans for the shoring and structural stability of what's to stay. You, yes, add? that's what I was about to say. Okay. Thank you. 
I have a few questions, Michelle. Um, when you say they are doing that, is this the city? Is this a contractor for the city? Uh, who, is, who is the they doing this? So I'm going to have Kevin Matthews speak to that. I, I believe I know the details of this. But well, you know the details. But basically, you know, it's being built through the Florida League of Cities Insurance Company. They have a contractor on board that they use, a Synergy NDS, that they use to do their reconstruction. So they are going to only re, um, rebuild the portion that was existing. So uh, the additional work, like the build out of the warehouse section, the city is going to contribute to that section and also for the site work. So it's being rebuilt through the insurance company's um, manager, construction manager. Is the city overseeing that work? Yes. So you have inspectors out there? Well, not necessarily inspectors, but I'm the project manager and we're integrally involved in the process. So they have to follow our purchasing policies and basically we're going to review the bid packages. And yes, we're going to be a part of the inspections. Uh, I am not an architect or an engineer and certainly not one that knows uh, restoration. But the supports that I saw for those arches looked pretty puny. And when, where I've seen reconstruction before, there's a whole uh, structure to support the entire arch rather than just a metal uh, piece that is holding them up. And I'm, as a non-professional, wondering if this is really historic preservation or this is just a contractor that may or may not have those, that experience and, and those capabilities. Uh, those structures or the, the poles, uh, the, the props that are put there were just because of the condition that the column started to come down. So it's just a temporary measure just to keep it in place for safety. But the plans that we have to support the entire structure, that has not been in place, uh, put in place yet. So that, that's going to be coming forth pretty soon. Okay. Is there a security perimeter around the building so there's no further damage? There was not before the fire. The fence is full, the property is fully fenced. It's, it's on the west side as every, well? Every, everywhere, you cannot get into that property without going through a gate. And are there security cameras? No. Not yet anyways. It would seem to me, given the experience we've had with that building, that might not be a bad idea. Um, I have a question. Is, just, just one more question. Is there money in the budget now to do that restoration? Most of the funds will be coming from the insurance company and the city has budgeted a million dollars to contribute towards that effort and potentially, maybe depending on what the budget cycle is for this year, may be contributing a little bit more. I'm not sure. So. And that's in, so this, that's in this available. year's budget. That's not the city has some allocated, date in the future. The city has allocated a million dollars towards the reconstruction, and most of the reconstruction will be paid by the insurance company. And that's in the actual operating budget, not the capital improvement budget. We have a PO in place to pay the vendor Synergy, the construction company, for the city's contribution. And as I said before, most of the reconstruction effort will be paid by the insurance company. So yes, there is money available for the project. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I don't see any signs of fire in this area, and I'm curious as to why they were taking this apart. Ah, uh, because the structural integrity is, uh, is compromised. So when we start... That wasn't due to the fire. No, but a discovery. So there's no foundation. No, I understand what you're saying, but this doesn't have anything to do with the fire. This is just something when you started in there, you just took the slab out, and now the, the columns are coming down. Is right. That correct? But it doesn't have anything to do with the fire damage. I cannot answer that question per se, but what I can tell you is that there's no foundation system there to support the existing. The condition that it's in due to the slab being removed under it, I don't see any fire damage. Yes. Yeah. You should say that. Yeah. Can I say 
Thank you. Sure. Okay. So restoration rehabilitation of this structure involves site improvements as well. So we cannot create a structure that doesn't have sidewalks, driveways, parking lots, landscaping. So part of the work that they were doing was preparing the site, which involved removing of that, that area. And discovery to ensure structural stability of this portion of the building for the building purposes, not just site purposes. Mm -hmm. So it was exploratory what they were working on and, and, and shoring and saving up the building where it was starting to fall in on itself. So I, I understand what your question is, but if, and I did go out there with Kevin, he and I both have gone out. Um, I photographed the best I could up in the scuttle holes above this portion of the building and there was smoke damage inside the, the ceiling of the port cashier. So it's, um, they were exploring to see how far did that go? What did they need to do to make that portion of the building sound? I hope that answers your question. I think so. Is this altering the schedule or are we just, you're just reporting here to what the condition is and it's moving forward? And Correct. So if, if we did, as it's an unsafe, our requirement is to come to the board, yes. let you know what the, keep you apprised of the changes that happen on the property. Because we wouldn't want to take the pork share down, have someone drive by and say, hey, I thought that was being saved. So it's our responsibility to come with the chief building official and staff and give you an update on where it's at. So it, it's not affecting schedule at this point. Um, and we don't anticipate it to affect schedule. Okay. Okay, the great. architect is already working with the new drawings and preparing those. Okay. Back to Ron, sort of to Rhonda's question for a moment. Have we, have you looked at the foundation in the part of the building which was most damaged by fire to make sure that this condition that is now being faced doesn't also occur with the rest of the building. That's what they're working through right now. So if there's any further updates, we would come back to you and let you know um, of any issues with the condition. Now remember the portion that's directly behind this, which is where the restrooms, the offices, the ticket window was, is completely and totally burned. There's nothing left inside. So what we're looking for is to give you an update. And if you have any comments or recommendations that you would like us to include as we move forward and proceed, um, there's no formal motion or anything required of the board. You may or may not provide feedback with a recommendation or any comments. I, I would just be concerned that to the degree that there's this damage in a part that wasn't significantly burned, there could be just as much, if not worse, damage in the part that was seriously burned. The damage that was serious, the part that was seriously burned, there's l well, literally rubble inside of that building, so. I'm talking about the supporting structure. Mm -hmm. I think that can be noted on the record that that's a comment, and um, but I do think she's advised that if there's any other portions that need to be discussed, it will come back to you if it, if it needs a demolition. Just, if I may, just one more question. Is there any possibility that the Registry of Historic Places is in jeopardy because of any of this? The day it burned, that happened. So I, the day it burned or the day after, I spoke with the state of Florida, and maybe it was that week. I don't want to go on record and say it was the day of, but it was shortly after the, the structure burned. And the state had already heard about it. And what they, and I've testified to this, some of the other board members may remember, and I know, Mr. Chard, you weren't on the board at that time. So as an update, um, this, the state of Florida has said they will assess the condition of the building when the work is complete as to whether or not it can remain on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, Mr. Heisenbottle has had buildings in a similar circumstance where they did a reconstruction and the building was able to stay on the re National Register. We can keep it on the local register because we're in charge of that. So we do not need to remove it from the local register. But we'll have to wait until the building's completed and assess with the state. The state was very clear in saying that they're not updating the National Register. They're so busy. Um, 
that they're not coming for it and saying, What's, what are you doing? They're waiting to see our progress. I had one question. Um, looking at the subsurface beneath the concrete slab, it looks incredibly unstable. Looking at what? I'm sorry, Mr. Osnoff. You've got the slab, and then beneath the slab is, is obviously the one might want it to be dirt, but it looks to me like it's sand. It looks incredibly unstable. Well, it looks like it was um, constructed. There is a slab on grade condition. Is that accurate for this area? Yeah. The poor cachet? It, slab on grade was very common form of architecture for this time period. Um, so all of that will have to be rebar will have to be put in that area structural um, integrity will have to be added throughout the building already no problem so i think the recommendation is that now we know and we should assume that the rest of the foundation and structure may be similar to this order to share so that the, the plans really do need to be established so that proper shoring and stabilization is in place and you can't just go cutting up your slab on grade because obviously the slab on grade is what's holding the walls together. So um, to the extent that our, our consultants are, are doing that, that really does need to be addressed. We will share that um, recommendation, that comment from the board with the contractor and the architect, but I do remind you that that may not resolve issues that are happening in the field. But we will share that comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you. So moving along to the quasi-judicial hearing items, item eight. So th is this where we're, cha we're changing from 8A? So because we're um, doing a postponement, um, we'll need that motion to postpone, but because it is an agenda item, if there's anybody who has any public comment um, that wishes to speak on this item, Oh, sorry, Michelle, if you want to introduce the file for the record. And oh, then, sure, yeah. Um, uh, Michelle Hoyland, Principal Planner for the record. I should have said that already. Item 8A is for 231 Venetian Drive. I'd like to enter file number 2021-086 into the record. This is a COA, variance, and waiver request. So as I was saying, since it has been noticed, um, if there's anybody in the public that wishes to speak to this, it'll be noted for the record for next time, and then you can do the motion. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item? Okay. See no public comment. The date would be June 1st for the postponement. So we'll, when you do your motion, you can include that. Okay, we have a motion. Postpone. I, I make a motion to postpone the certificate of appropriateness item 2021-086 until a date certain June meeting, historic preservation meeting. June 1st. Second. Kristen Finn? Yes. Robert Ostinoff? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Jim Chard? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Okay, the next item on our agenda is item 8B. This is for 401 West Atlantic Avenue, the property known as Ziri Thai and Sushi Restaurant. I'd like to enter file number COA 2022-031 into the record. Um, this is actually a class two and a COA application. Um, Mr. Jeff Costello is the agent for the project and he will present uh, the request to you now. Do you have a clicker over there? Okay. 
Let me pull up your presentation. Thank you. So before we before we get into the presentation, um, shall I read the quasi-judicial hearing rules? Yes, please. Okay. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the City of Delray Beach quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes. The person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, board, members, staff, and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant may be allowed, will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or an appeal may not legally be made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. Law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of the law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. And having said that, is there any ex parte communication on this? Item. None. Robert? None. None for me? None. None. Well, I did drop by. That counts. Special tonight. <laughs> okay. Just want to make one more reminder as well. We do have the 10 minute limitations on the quasi judicial hearings now. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I'll make it quick. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, uh, Jeff Costello, JC Planning Solutions, Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, here representing Ziri Tainshushi. Uh, also here tonight is Penn Suskin, Ziri, Carol Perez, our landscape architect, and Roger Cope, our architect who worked on the plans. Um, this property, I'm pretty sure or hope everybody's very familiar with it. It's a the um, Occupy, the restaurant occupies a bay at the northwest corner of uh, Atlantic Avenue and Northwest 4th Avenue uh, in 401 West Atlantic Avenue in, in the Atlantic Road development. Um, just a little area, a little, little closer up, close up there at the corner and uh, some photos. So uh, on the, these particular photos show the east side of the building where the majority of the changes are taking place. Uh, a couple views uh, of that particular area. And then on the, at the northwest corner along Atlantic Avenue, as you see, there's the, uh, you know, the, the steps that will be a portion of them that will be eliminated for the dining area. And then the railing, which we are gonna match. Uh, the proposal uh, consists of about a 600 square foot outdoor dining area on the east and south sides of the restaurant uh, removal of the steps, as I indicated, along Atlantic Avenue and in installation of a rail uh, consistent with the rails that currently exist. Um, removal of a portion of the, the planter areas uh, along the east side and, and installing uh, pavers and includes tree grates to re and we're going to replace the unhealthy live oaks. And in your staff report, there's uh, some analysis and, and statements regarding orange Geiger trees, what we were originally proposing. Uh, we were going to move forward to provide cathedral oaks, which uh, should comply with the with staff's recommendation. Um, and then also, we the proposal includes removal of all the dome style awnings uh, along the restaurant facade and replacing it with three black shed style awnings. This here's uh, on this slide. Sorry, Mr. Costello, to interrupt you. I, I really apologize, but I did misspeak and said 10 minutes. You have 20 minutes, so I apologize okay, for so that. I got, I, won't, I, I got two more minutes. <laughs> See, we're all getting hungry just looking at this. We got to go get something to eat. I apologize. <laughs> so, anyway, but thank you. Um, so here the, before you are the, the site plan. <laughs> And this is, uh, shows the pedestrian clear zone in compliance with the city's regulations. And so it, it shows that and then our landscape plan, which is a little bit clearer. So um, anyway, that's just what, is, what we needed to provide. And it kind of clearly delineates where the uh, proposed improvements are. Um, with regard to the, the awnings, uh, this particular photo show the, the awnings, uh, how they'll uh, be placed on the building. Um, and then also the rail system, which is going to match 
exactly what is um, on the on the steps that currently exist. So with that, you know, it's given the fact that with what we've experienced the past couple of years, and we know that a lot of people have more open area, and the restaurant is is a little tight. So this will allow some area outside, which is really uh, going to help the restaurant and the fact that they really ex experienced some some situations during um, the, the the pandemic. Also, this does uh, this is a situation with the outdoor dining that's encouraged uh, through the city and CRA's redevelopment efforts uh, and generating that activation and activity along uh, Atlantic Avenue. So with that. We believe you can fake, make the positive findings uh, with regard to the COA in class two, uh, as stated, um, consistent with the Ollie's Delray um, comprehensive plan, meets all the criteria, criteria set forth in the land development regulations. Also, positive findings can be made with section 246H5 uh, that the CRA is consistent with the comp plan, as well as the four and 4.5.1, the preservation guidelines and Secretary of Interior Standards, landscape plan consistent with 4616, and the architectural elevations are consistent with a 451E7, as well as 416E1 through three. So with that, it's pretty straightforward, and if there's any questions, we're here to uh, answer them, and appreciate your support uh, for this proposal. did it in five minutes. <laughs> well done. I guess I could ask a question or two. We're on staff presentations. So. I'm sorry, I didn't, <laughs> didn't see quite all right. <laughs> okay, um, for the record, I'm Michelle Hewitt. Uh, this is agenda item 8B, 41 West Atlantic Avenue, Ziri Time Sushi Restaurant uh, for COA 2022-031. Um, and this is in the West Settlers Historic District. Okay, so here is the location map of the entire um, subject property. Um, the subject property is highlighted in yellow um, and the whole Atlantic Grove development is outlined in red. Um, just a brief history on the project, um, there are currently eight um, buildings um, or townhomes in addition to the two mixed use buildings at the bottom there, 401, which is where the uh, subject property is located in 31 West Atlantic to the east. Um, the townhomes got approved for an additional 14 townhomes um, and two buildings in a cabana um, in 2021. And then in, earlier this year in 2022, um, they got approved for um, mill finished entry roofs. Um, the subject property is not outlined within the West Settlers Historic District. However, the townhomes are within the district. And as the subject property is a part of the overall development, it gets treated as such. Okay, so here we have a survey of the property. The indoor portion is highlighted in purple and the um, area uh, for the modifications is outlined or highlighted in blue. So we have this existing site plan. So there are currently the eight uh, awnings on both the south and east side of the project or property. Um, we have uh, these laurel, laurel oak trees that are there along with hedges and the uh, outdoor dining in purple at the bottom on the south side of the property. So we have the proposed site plan here, which will replace the eight awnings with the three uh, black shed style awnings, um, the uh, replacement of the laurel oak trees, as well as the removal of hedges and replacement with brick pavers, um, and the removal of the steps on the south side and in the addition of the railings. Um, so here's a little close-up here of where the steps will be removed and the rail or the where the railings will be placed and the railings are to match the existing aluminum railings that are there at the moment so here we have the existing um, images of the property 
um, with this, the current outdoor dining, the steps, and you can kind of see the railing there at the corner. We have the east side of the property with the laurel oaks and the hedges. And then we have the main entrance, better view of the railings as well, and the steps also. So everything highlighted in blue is proposed to be um, changed. So we have the awnings, the dome style awnings, again, with the black shed style. The railings are to match the one highlighted there in the aluminum, and the outdoor dining will be um, uh, modified when the steps are removed. So um, for the shed style awnings, um, these are on the building to the east, 301 West Atlantic Avenue. Um, and these are all along the edge here and also at the corner, at the, also in the building to the east. Um, so we had landscape, landscape comment that the applicant mentioned. Um, so whatever replacement there is needs to be approved by city staff. Um, uh, pending what they choose to, to propose. And again, here are the laurel oak trees. And here are the findings for um, the board to uh, reference when uh, making a decision on the project. And oh, um, one, can I make a modification to the site plan technical items before public comment or would I do that afterwards? You can tell them now. Okay, so we just have one small change to the site plan technical items that the uh, laurel oak trees be replaced with the same species or alternate species um, and be approved by the approved by the city. That was our change there, approved by the city. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much. Public comment. There's the public, all of us. Oh, they're all here. Most of us. George Law, 46 North Swinton. It, so it certainly looks like a good deal. I even shouldn't even be up here, but I never know which way these boards and commissions and things are, are going to go. And I'm sorry after I sit down sometimes <laughs> what happens. But obviously, um, outdoor dining is a good thing. It, it's very consistent with what we're doing at other areas of Atlantic Avenue. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none. Is there any rebuttal or cross-examination from staff or the applicant? No. Um, none from staff. Okay. None from the applicant. None from the applicant either. Okay, good. Um, board discussion. Okay, I have some questions. Um, and I'm gonna start with, with staff. Um, Mr. Costello said that these were unhealthy. Um, and I, in the nursery report, it said they had tip decline and nutrition, nutritional deficit. So I, I didn't think that those were unhealthy, unhealthy, had to be removed. Um, uh, so I sort of am questioning that a little bit, but also, I see that somewhere, maybe Jeff said they were going to use cathedral oaks. Now we're, we're talking um, not scientific names, so maybe even Carol can address this. Uh, compare a cathedral oak unto a laurel oak. Um, and I see that the uh, nurseryman said that the problem was it needed a certain uh, roof, roof, uh, a minimum roof zone, root zone. Will these in their new, uh, the new trees or whichever, whatever trees in there, will they have sufficient root zone? And so that we don't have unhealthy, nutritionally deficient trees. Um, and also in the site plan, technical items, usually we don't comment on that, but it says same species or alternate species, but it doesn't mention size. So I'd like to at least make sure that we're not going smaller, that we're going larger. Can you answer those questions for me, Carol? I can, thank, thank you. you. I'm Carol Perez with AGT Land. Uh, the laurel oaks that are there, they're in decline and their percentage rate is one's at 30% and one's at 40%, which is a pretty poor tree. 
So what we're going to do instead, um, staff recommends replacing with same species or like species. And we've, we're going with an oak tree, but it's called a cathedral oak. And cathedral oaks grow a little bit more upright. Um, they're, it'll be a Florida number one tree. It'll be 16 foot tall. The oaks that are there now, they're probably not even 16 foot tall. Um, they are really in poor condition. And then we're putting one in a tree grate, so that'll have um, all that uh, soil will be dug out with new planting soil in that one to give it a good life. And then the other tree um, does not have a tree grate. It goes right into a planter. And then we're putting some uh, low ground cover around that planter. And that will be sufficient room for that to grow also. Okay, so the, uh, a reason you're choosing a more upright tree rather than a larger canopy tree is because of the tightness of space with the sidewalk and the building? That's true, but it is considered a large canopy tree. Okay. Um, so that also was staff's, uh, staff wanted a large canopy tree replacing a large canopy tree. So that's why we went with that exact species. Okay. and. They, so they will be replaced with larger. You said 16 feet. I think the, the report on the other one said they were seven feet. One was seven, one was six and a half, I believe, that, they, that I somehow got out of the other report. <laughs> well, it's a 16 foot high. It's, it's, it's going to be a standard um, tree specification for the city of Delray Beach. So that's 16 foot high, seven foot spread. It'll have a six foot straight trunk. That's, that's code required. It's actually code required for a street tree, and we're treating these as a street tree, so they're a little larger than um, but Okay, so what we're getting is better. You're getting better. Okay. You're getting Florida number one trees, and they're going to be healthy and, and happy. And why, why are these nutrient deficient? Who maintains these? Um, I don't know too much about the maintenance of, of those trees, but I will say that laurel oaks um, do not have a long lifespan. Uh, it's consistent. They get to a certain point and they decline. And we've seen that throughout our area. Okay, yeah. I and know these, I, these have probably been in for 20, what, how old is 20 years. Okay. Well. I would like everything, our trees to be fed, the new ones, but anyway. <laughs> fed and watered, yes. And happy. And happy. Yeah, we like happy trees. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. The trouble with letting Claudia go first is she gets all the good questions. <laughs> um, so I won't go into trees at all, um, but I had some of those those same concerns that you have that uh, that the nutritional deficiencies continue even with a, a new tree, and I'm not I'm not sure we know the answer to that question. Um, I my question is a little bit on sidewalks. How much of the sidewalk are we losing to pedestrians, if any, uh, with the uh, with the uh, seats and tables? answer that um, yes. what we're actually doing is increasing the width of the sidewalk along 4th Avenue from approximately five feet to approximately seven so that's in the public right-of-way so it's actually being increased the outdoor dining area the way it's designed and, and the engineering requirements is basically going to cut off there's going to be a header curb right at the property line so you aren't losing any any public sidewalk and then along along the um, along Atlantic the steps are on or right at the edge of the property. So those aren't in the public right away. So that's, you, you, there's no public side. Actually, pedestrian zones being increased. So. There won't be tables in that pedestrian zone? Uh, not on 4th Avenue. They do have the option in the future. They want to go, they had a sidewalk cafe permit. If they want to modify that, uh, really the, the best place would be along Atlantic Avenue. But I think really, as they looked at their operation, their desire is to, to keep it a little bit more elevated and separate from the public realm. So in the future, if they decide to move forward, it would require a sidewalk cafe permit. We'd go back through that process. But at this proposal, 
is to have the outdoor dining on the actual property. And may I answer a tiny clarification on this? So on this side right here, this is the Northwest 4th Avenue side, and that, that's the hedging that's being removed to accommodate additional paver bricks for dining over here. This property was developed prior to the CBD standards as they exist today. So you'll see in the staff report, there was a discussion about streetscape standards um, we worked with the applicant to ensure that the required pedestrian clear zone at, by today's code is provided at a minimum here so that it, the pedestrian clear zone actually increases. Um, the curb zone is out past the curb where the um, island and parking space are. So there, yeah, I can actually do this. This area here <laughs> increases and the pedestrian clear zone or the curb zone is out to the east of that so it will exceed what the um, current conditions are and meet the requirements of the code i think that's maybe where you were going yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly i will ask one tree question carol um you, you talked about heights and 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 uh the uh, uh, nothing about the real size of the trunk of the tree other than the six foot clear zone. Uh, are we getting a, a tree of comparable size in terms of DBH so that it's not just a stick? Yes, you're getting the, I, I'm not sure if it's a, I'm not sure what code is, but um, it's most likely it's gonna be at least two inches, maybe three inches for caliper. But not four or six. Uh, I would have to. I would have to look at um, okay. this. You know what's the, the nurseries to actually tell you. But it could be four. It's a large tree. Sixteen foot is is a large um, large tree. I would say minimum. You know, three inch caliper. Okay, so looking in that photograph, oh. our new trees are going to be just as big, or is that tree just as tall? We're not going to have to wait 20 years for them to get there? I would say those trees are probably 14 to 16 foot right there. I mean, you know, 16 foot, you're going up a story and a half, basically. And those are probably about, it, it's going to be comparable. Okay, I just, we don't want to wait 20 years to get where we are. I think, I don't think. Thank Michelle, you. Michelle would like yeah. to add. Just to add, um, well, one of the requirements is that the replacement shall be the same species or an alternate species approved by the city. That also includes size of the width of the tree, all of that. It doesn't state that, though. It just says must be replaced with the same or alternate species. It doesn't reference the size or height. So the entire tree preservation code in 4619 mm -hmm. covers that. Okay. Throughout, so um, I think the species that is being proposed would likely be found to be um, equivalent by the city's landscape senior landscape planner. Should it not be, she would work with them to make sure it is. And if they weren't doing what they're required by code, they would have to request a waiver and come back to the board to ask for an approval of anything less. I wasn't exactly talking about what you only had to have by code. If we're approving tree removal, I'd like to make sure we're getting as large of a tree. Or, you know, I, I, if code is a, a minimal size, then... That's not what the code states. It's, I'm okay. not suggesting it's by the minimum. I'm okay. suggesting it's by the, the minimum requirements for the tree preservation code. And in this case there, I believe you said 16 foot. I wrote down 16 foot high, seven foot spread and a six foot straight trunk, which cathedral, cathedral oaks are great for that because it allows clear area to navigate under. So I think that's, that is what we're getting. Okay. Yes, and we had the discussion with staff um, through comments about the size and, uh, and about these trees counting as streetscape trees because we were unable to put them out at the street because there's a parallel parking space there. So instead, we're moving them in, and they're going to be on the property. Okay.
So we've talked about trees. Does anybody have any concerns about brick pavers and color pattern? Are we okay with what, what's being proposed? These are real bricks, right? Not stamped concrete. to match. It's a herringbone pattern consistent with what's out there. Yeah, I was going to say it's consistent. There we have it. There we have it. Do you want to put up the motion sure. screen, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Looks like they're moving toward that. I don't want to speak for you guys. <laughs> I'll be here. I'm going to make a motion if we're ready for it. Um, let me make sure I got the right one so I don't mess it up. Um, so it would be B then. Make a motion that we approve the certificate of appropriateness and class two site plan modification. The property <coughs> located at 401 West Atlantic Avenue, AKE Ziri Thai and Sushi Restaurant slash Atlantic Grove. Settlers Historic District by finding that the request and approval thereof is consistent with the comprehensive plan and meets the criteria set forth in the land development regulation. Second. With the question. So don't we need to say subject to the following conditions? It's, it's actually a site plan technical item. I was going to say that. Um, so it would travel with either B or C motion. Um, that is necessary and so must be included. So it's a, the motion was acceptable. Okay. And I Second. apologize. Um, we normally put them in a different section now, so I should have moved that on this report. Um, but I just future. want to make it clear. Just like with low E glass, I like to make it clear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the site plan technical item is as modified here and will be in, included in the approval letter. Okay. Okay. So amendment, sh I mean, it should proceed as, amendment should proceed as stated. You don't, you don't need to read it into the record. Okay. Second. Your motion. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Kristen Finn? Yes. Robert Ostinov? Yes. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Kim Chard? Yes. Leo Willis? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sushi. Sushi for everybody. Oh, yeah. Okay, so next we have a um, concept plan review. I'd like to enter um, for agenda item 9A. This is 303 Southeast 7th Avenue, and I'd like to enter file number COA 2022-133 into the record. Um, the applicant will make a presentation. There's no presentation by staff. The only thing I'm going to remind the board of, just because we see these so infrequently, um, is what is a concept plan review? This is the applicant can come before the board, show you a conceptual idea for a property that they wish to make modifications to. It is a non-binding review. The material provided by the potential developer or applicant is going to be presented in the same manner that it was submitted to staff. The board shall review, and if they wish to make comment on the concept, they can. This is the non-binding, which means there's no motion there's no action there's no written statement you are merely discussing the proposal with the applicant um, if you wish to and mr gareth dunn the architect for the owners will make a presentation to you mr dunn this one actually is 10 minutes um because we do treat <laughs> concept <laughs> plan reviews like presentations sure can i do that uh you should have a clicker there Okay, right. let me wipe it down for you. Um, but the clicker, you you know, we'll have here too. Oh, so. Okay. 
Since this is a non-voting item, we don't need to go through ex parte? No. No. Hi, good evening. Um, we've met a few of you guys before, but um, a different property. But my name is Gareth. I'm the principal architect with um, Hotelier, and I'm here with my clients to discuss uh, preliminary um, concept designs that we've put together over the last, well, it's been about six, seven months now. So uh, let's get into this. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about the location, uh, the site description analysis, give you a uh, evolution of the property uh, since it was constructed in, 19, in the 1950s. Talk about the current floor plans on the original floor plans, and then I'm going to kind of pop into a couple of options or ideas that we're looking to do with the possible property in a future review board, um, full, full, uh, full submittal, and then I'll have a few conclusions for you. This the location um, is on the three blocks south of Atlantic. It's an historical marina district. The zoning is an R1 AA single family. Uh, the original structure was a contributing masonry built in 55. It's undergone numerous building modifications over time. Um, my clients, Donald and Bianca Pucci, have owned the property since September. And been, we've been working on this project, and like I said, they're looking to relocate from Boca and actually move to Delray Beach themselves. So. Here we get an idea of the site, um, just so you guys know it. This is on the corner. This is just one block. It's actually the second house from the end of the Marina District historic neighborhood. It's on the corner of 3rd and 7th. Um, the, the rectangular shape of the lot, actually, it used to be a much deeper lot and went all the way to the intercoastal, I believe, when it was first built in the 50s. And over time, this was um, divided by the owner. and. This is the smaller section on the on seventh, and then there is a, a property behind it that's directly on the intercoastal. Um, the yellow you can see here is the uh, existing building, and what I'm indicating the, the red dotted line around is the buildable maximum buildable area that this property has. So you can see just from what we're trying to work with here, we're getting close to you know working, whether it's the north or south side, that we're going to be maximizing the area on the site that's buildable, but it isn't a huge site. It's only 8,200 8, square feet. The existing residence in total is 1,848. Our maximum building area will only allow us to be 3,200. So the yellow, like I said, is the existing structure. Um, the area in red and the pinky red is the possible area of the property that's not got any structure on it. And then the two areas to the south and north that are overlapping, they're areas of possible renovation that we're going to discuss shortly. One, essence, one other item to just to consider, this is, like I said, they're very close to the intercoastal. Uh, the finished floor elevation on this home is less than five feet. The average crown of the road in this neighborhood is only three and a half feet. So during flooding and different times of the year, hurricanes, high tides, there can be a considerable amount of rain in the streets and coming up from the inner coastal. This is the evolution of the property. So up at the top left there, you can see the original elevation from the architect in the 50s and the footprint below showing the original footprint. On the right there, we see the footprint that's been enlarged over time. There's been three or four different variations of increase to the property. And as you can see from the elevation, there's been considerable change in the elevation with very little consistency in what well, as an addition should go. It's almost looking like three separate parts as opposed to one building. The windows were altered completely all around the property. Carports were enclosed and made a studio apartment to the left where you see the arch. The roof was changed from flat tile to barrel tile and there's some sections that are flat also. Uh, materials were removed and just, you know, Basically, from the original version, the planters removed. It was just really trimmed back in all directions and 
changed considerably. And instead of it being masonry now, most of the property is actually wood frame at the moment. So here you can see the, the versions of the original house on the right, you know, very standard for that period. Uh, the flat section with the rectangular flat concrete slab roof that was on the property at the time, covering the carport. And then to the front here, you're seeing the current home where there's been a little nook added on the front of the house. There's been the whole apartment change on the, the north side. And there's been a bay and bathroom addition in the rear. So this will give you kind of an idea. We have a client here, obviously, you know, they're looking to move into Dari Beach. You know, it's kind of making a family, family size home. And we're trying to be respectful and we're trying to be, you know, well within the visual standards and in, in contributing elements of the property. So we're going to give you a couple of little options here so you can see where we're heading. We've, this is a version of the two story we're calling the South. So we're adding a two story basically a building on the, on the south side, removing this current swimming pool, and we're gonna add the two-story section on this south side, which increases the air conditioning space to about 1,500 from the original version. The north side is gonna get, a, you know, the garage will be put back on there instead of it being the, the apartment, and it'll be renovated. The front section of the house will get the look again, the, the planes, the same feel, the rhythm, the proportions of the original home. Uh, in regard to the building on the far right, it's, we've recessed the building as, as much as possible in terms to still have function. And then on the second floor, we've also recessed that even further so that you'll see later in elevation, it doesn't become too dominant as opposed to the original house. So this would be the new renderings of the, or the new elevations of the house as you see it from 7th and also from 3rd Street in this version. So you can see the, the two-story section on the right side, relatively plain and recessed back, obviously, in this version here. I will show you a three-dimensional one shortly that will clarify a little better. But, and then on the left side, you can see from 3rd Street, you see in the second story, but it's obviously 70 feet south of the, of the street. So on the left-hand side of the property, the main structure, you can see that we've reintroduced the planters, we've reintroduced the, the flat roof over the garage area, we've reintroduced the materials, come back to the concrete tile. We've really, you know, proportions and size of all the windows. We're trying to bring this back as if this was the original house as it was built back in the 50s. And then obviously to the right there, we have a connection, a minimum connection to the building that doesn't then interfere if this was to ever change again in the future. So here you can see a, you know, a conceptual elevation of the, of the property from 7th and also from the corner of 3rd and 7th. So this is the front view here. And then you're going to see, obviously, the, you've got the planners and all the windows and everything else. And then on the right side there, you can see the second story addition. And this is roughly, you know, eye level midpoint of the street, slightly to the right side of the west side of the street. So you get a kind of sense of what that building looks like. Now we're going to talk about the opposite version of this, where we're going to just go with a single story addition on the south side and actually had a small a secondary stu structure on the third street. It is smaller than the, the one that we were doing on the south, just because of the proportions and the area of the property that we're going to be raising rather than just you know using the whole side of the house which would change it completely um, the main body of the house again from the from seventh you know we're really re bringing it back to the existing version the look the feel the materials and then you know having a single story addition recessed on the right side with the roofs as you can see here how they tie in the geometry of the roof everything going back to really its original form Still having the flat section over the garage area, you know, bringing that element of the flat slab, which was over the car original carport. And the homeowners would have a second story on the right side, and then a small balcony, kind of leave it off the balcony back just because of the setback issue that we can't go down to the ground, obviously, for building purposes. So this now you see the opposite, very like, you know, it's kind of the two story on the, on the north side. Um, you see in the, the single story on the south. We're intentionally leaving materials off 
basically the addition errors. So we're almost kind of giving a hierarchy in how we're performing the work, saying the main structure, the original 50s, is the dominant force here. And the addition to the property is we kind of, you know, that's secondary in its nature. And it's also, like I said, recessed in, in its feel on the property. Again, two dimensional ideas can obviously, you may feel that everything is flush and lined up. But in fact, when you see it from the streetscape, it, it, you know, it, you do see that the, the main building is prominently in the front and the other buildings are, you know, more to the rear, kind of taking a, a back seat in terms of what the, what the um, design intentions were. You've actually hit your 10 minute mark. So. Yeah. So really, like I said, I'm just looking, you know, we're looking for direction. You know, we're trying to do a, you know, a good, a good project here for the clients, but also respect the wishes of the board and, you know, bring these homes, you know, make a contributing property and ideas in the neighborhood, basically. So I'd like to, you know, thank you for the time and any observations would help. And um, I do believe my clients would like to say just a couple of quick words because they are here, and if that would be okay with you guys. I'm sorry. It's, it's up to the board. They're just asking for a little bit more time to allow their clients to say a word or two. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to be honest. This, this may not be a word or two, but it'll only be a few minutes, I promise. Hi, my name is Bianca. And Don, my husband, and I really appreciate you taking the time to review our plan improvements. I lived in the Boca and Delray area since 1971. Don and I raised our family here. We plan to make this our forever home with our two daughters and my mom. Our intention is to cooperate fully with the city and at the same time provide a modern and enjoyable home for our family in this beautiful Marina Historic District. Now, I know this is a concept review, so I may be going into a little bit more detail than I would probably at the COA, but I would like to point out some items. Regarding the lot, when the lot was first platted, Gareth noted it was a long lot stemming from the intercoastal to 7th Avenue. So once the lot was replatted, the setbacks were added. So the availability of a backyard on the east side is not an option. Instead, the south boundary of the house has the maximum space for outdoor living. In fact, now, the assisting pool that was added in 2000 is only accessible from doors exiting two bedrooms. Because the lot's orientation, placing an addition directly behind the home, is not feasible. I also want to point out that in 1988, when the Marina Historic District was established, this home was classified as a non-contributive structure, most likely due to its age. It was built in 1955. In 2008, a field survey compiled by GAI consultants specifically identified this home as a Mediterranean revival with no alterations. The home and few others were reclassified as, non, as contributing, and other homes were removed from their contributing status due to significant alterations. Now, have you already seen from the drawings that Garrett showed you, the city, the, which we obtained from the city, the structure was not a Mediterranean revival, but it was rather designed as a mid-century ranch home. The structure is still a one-story home, like the original home. However, in our opinion, an objective review would argue that the defining historical architectural features of this structure no longer exist. Now, our goal is to restore this home back to the original historic design. We feel very comfortable meeting the visual compatibility standards. The challenge, however, in applying the LDR standards is that the remnants left of the contributing structure are mainly in the interior of the home and no longer visible. Now, Gareth has already pointed this out, all the changes, I won't go over them. I will say that the pool, which was added in 2000, and the barrel tile roof, which was retiled in 2007, had approvals from the city, but no approvals from the historic board. Now, I'm not here to pursue a reclassification of this home as non-contributing. That is not our objective. We're asking you for help. We're asking you to reasonably consider these circumstances when reviewing our plans. We very much like the project of restoring this historic character back in this house. Now, we've worked with the city since October, I'm not gonna lie, it was, it's been somewhat frustrating. However, Michelle and her team have been very gracious and very patient with us in taking the time to educate us on these standards. After several iterations, the city recommended a constant plan review to get feedback directly from you to how to proceed. 
Again, I want to let you all know that we're here in the spirit of cooperation, and we really very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any feedback mm -hmm. or comments? I, I can talk on it for a minute. <laughs> I've lived in the Marine History District for 32 years. I used to live a couple houses down from this on 7th Avenue. I dare say most of the work that was done on it was permitted, and uh, it never came before the historic board, <laughs> um, starting with the enclosing of the garage. Um, so I think it's nice that you are bringing back the, the garage and, uh, and the original roof cov covering. Um, our loyalty always is to the house and the historic district. I know that owners change and needs change uh, for the size of house, downsizing, upsizing, but our loyalty and our client is the house. So that's the way we have to look at this project. You're on a difficult spot because you are on that corner. So you too do have two street views. You're also in an odd location because of many uh, former decisions. Uh, we lost most of that block of the historic district due to inappropriate uh, construction and it was removed from the historic district. But you are the second house in and the house behind you also on the intercoastal is still on it as well as the house across from you. Um, so, you know, all I can recommend is really looking at the Secretary of Interior Standards, really looking at the design guidelines, because I'm sure that's what staff is telling you. And really, the Secretary of Interior start off with minimal change uh, um, as a suggestion to historic properties. So. Uh, going from a one-story to a two-story, it, it, it's difficult there. Also, I might add, looking at the new additions that you want to add, you might want to study the windows that are historic in the neighborhood because it looks like those windows are modern and not on the historic contributing structures, not, not non-contributing, because that is how we need to focus here. Okay, that's all I have for right now. Any other comments? I'll comment just by saying I like the idea of getting rid of some of the um, questionable additions and bringing this back to its original um, architectural style, I think that's really, um, I, I really support that. I think that that's great. Um, I'm a little troubled by the second floor piece, maybe it's because it doesn't really match the shape of the original, but, um, but I like the idea of bringing back the, bringing back the original design. And I think you could make a really, really, um, great project uh, with a uh, maybe a mid mid-century modern exterior and uh completely 21st century interior i think that would be a really cool house uh, i'd like to ask michelle um on on the street what other houses uh, have a second story. Is this I'm vaguely familiar with this area, but not intimately familiar with each house? Um, I don't have the inventory of what's on the street, but whenever you do get a request like this, it's on a case by case basis. Um, they would have to submit a streetscape along with their submittal, which would show you that view. In this case, I think that it would be best served if they showed you seventh and third um, when they come in. So I, I don't know. And remember, this is non-binding. Um, should it take these folks some time to get in, you know, we're here in April. We do have some board members who are 
um, up for appointment in August, September you would be appointed to the board. So I wouldn't, I'm just being cautious in the advice that you give them because it could be a different composition of board members when they come back to the board. But again, any any comments or suggestions or anything like that, it is a non-binding and that the applicants are aware of this as it was read into the record as well. If you want to go ahead and just getting back onto the second story issue, because I think I think I've heard it among my fellow board members um, agreement with the idea of trying to go back to the original design, um, but perhaps the second story is troubling. Um, I'm not saying it is, but perhaps. Um, and so I would be interested in knowing what else is on either third or seventh, because certainly there are a lot of buildings in Marina Historic District that uh, have put a second story uh, usually in the back where it's harder to see. Um, and the, I think they really wanted advice or suggestions of two different options. And I, I'm having a little trouble <laughs> in viewing which is which here. I, I don't know, Ben, and based on your experience. Well, the options that I understood were the second floor either on the left side over the garage or the right side over the other other end of the house yeah, yeah. and yeah. such would also require a waiver so you have a you have the two-story over the north side of the house which would be on the street third street and then you have the two-story on the second on the south side of the property which is as you know we're, we're as far back in the property in that corner as we possibly can get it's it's just such a small lot the two-story would require a waiver to the second, secondary and subordinate standards, so you would have findings to review at the time of the application. Um, so you can, again, like Kelly said, you can give comments, um, but you're also not required to. I'm a little cautious on making too many comments um, for the reasons that you laid out. Um, the, the option that was, as we face it, on the left, if you'd help me out, Michelle. Um, I think Mr. Osnoff would like you to switch, yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, it's straight beyond two sides. Yeah, from the, you know, I don't, you know, you obviously have the most experience in the, in the marina, so I certainly wouldn't. Um, begin to think that I have that much knowledge, but in my riding around, it didn't seem that there was any shortage of second story additions. Most of them seemed, as I remember coming in front of us, were set back a bit, and they had a different impact to the street. But of course, if the lot doesn't allow that, then there's really not much of an option. Um, I looked at it from somewhat of a practical standpoint, what the house is like now, and what it would require for someone to occupy it with a family structure of the people who came before us. And I guess the question is, even if it's not perfect, the fact that there may be a trade to get what would be the house back that is closer to what has a historic integrity to it, and to trade that off for something that would offer the occupants the ability to have um, quantity, you know, or space, in other words, the, the second story. So while it doesn't fit perfectly, um, but is it a good trade? And that's sort of my, I don't have a conclusion, but I have a question. And that is, is that trade to get what we are getting in return worth being a little bit liberal in how we look at it? And that's my comment. Ultimately, it's the design guidelines, the Secretary of Interior Standards, and the LDRs that we have to use to make our decisions. So I think if you f follow those, then th that's what we'll be using to make our decisions. Yeah, I was fully aware of that. I wasn't going outside of those. I, if, I have to, you know, if I have to reinstate it, fitting within those guidelines, if everything else I said 
works, but I wasn't anticipating it going outside of any guidelines at all. That was not my intention. I thought within the guidelines, if that works and we get back a house now closer to what is historically, has historic integrity, is that a good trade? That was all I was trying to say. I think what I, I'm hearing is that you'd be willing to consider a trade-off between setbacks and, and height on that second floor. Correct, as long as, going back to your point, it fits within all of the... Yeah. The Secretary of Interior doesn't address setbacks so much. The Secretary it's of the Interior does address site and setting. Yeah, right. Um, there are recommended and not recommended approaches. And much of the reason why the applicant is here, as they stated in the beginning of the presentation, um, is where they were headed, we were a little bit concerned. And so we thought that they should talk to the board about the potential design. But you do have to use caution in taking a temperature or taking a, a somewhat pull on an item that would be a waiver or even a variance, which would be a publicly noticed item. So you wouldn't want to commit to saying, I would be willing to trade off reduced setbacks for <coughs> design Although it is a benefit to homeowners or an incentive that they can come to this board and ask for a variance should they need it um, or a waiver. So, no, I wasn't. I wasn't, Michelle, talking about a commitment. But I, what I was saying is, we're going to have an, a waiver either way, right? Uh, it depends what they submit. If they don't, if they don't come in with the second story. Um, I don't know that the addition to the side would require the waiver. We would have to assess that when they submitted. But the right off the bat for us, the second story we've advised is a waiver request. But that it wasn't quite my point. Uh, what I was saying is if the waiver was, th there was no second story and the waiver was for reducing the setbacks to get the same amount of square footage. That would be a variance. That would be a variance rather than a waiver. Correct. The waiver is to to add a second story to a one-story structure. You, The applicant is required to submit a waiver to the LDRs, section 451E7M, Good. Um, okay. which has six standards, six um, visual compatibility standards in there that speak about the addition not being forward of the front wall plane, that the addition be secondary and subordinate to the main massing of the structure. All of these things were fashioned into our code from the Secretary of the Interior Standards and Guidelines book. So that would be the waiver. If they wanted to have reduced setback, that would be a variance that does get publicly noticed um, by a mailer and advertisement on our website, among other things. Did I see the other view? Sure. Yeah, the one with the second story on the right. And when you show the isometric, is that from the corner of the streets where they come together? The, the lower left is literally right out front of the house. So you're standing on 7th across the street, probably on the just on the west side of the road. And then one of the top is you're exactly on the corner of 3rd and 7th. It's corner line. Well, right uh, my only comment would be I think that that would be the superior direction to go. Um, I like the fact that you're using um, the old plans to show the architectural look that it used to have. Uh, obviously, none of that is there, so you're sort of recreating it. But if you're if that's your streetscape, I like that the streetscape is on the the the, the one story is on the corner, and if you're doing the second story, that becomes more tucked back into the uh, property and also uh, with landscaping and so forth could blend in better. That would be my only comment. Thank you. Any other comments, thoughts? All right, we get to move on to awards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Also, just for your reference, the video from tonight's meeting will be made available online. So if you wanted to go back and just listen to it again, you could hear the board speaking in that video. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so in honor of 2022, Historic Preservation Month, National Historic Preservation Month. We are bringing back the awards program um, for a second year in a row. You'll remember last year was our first year relaunching the awards program in about a 10 year period of time. So you have a memorandum in your staff report uh, that highlights the nominees. There are quite a few fewer than there were last year. We had a large selection, a large pool of candidates to select from last year because it had been so long. Um, so we have fewer nominees this year in fewer categories. And I'm going to do a brief overview um, of each award category and each property. And then the board can deliberate and choose a winner. I think the last time we did this, we were virtual. Yeah, so now the criteria is these are projects that were completed? Yes, sir. These projects have a certificate of occupancy. Um, there were a few that were so close to getting their CO, um, but they didn't, so they'll have to be included in the pool for next year, which will be nice that we'll have some completed projects um, for next year, really nice things as well. So these projects are completed. They have a certificate of occupancy. And probably by former boards, correct? Could you ask that again? Uh, and probably uh, approved by former boards. Oh, all of these projects were board approved. I know, but not, not, not this existing oh, board. Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah the um, time frame for these approvals span from 2017 to about 2020. I think this date is wrong on this one. Okay, so yes, previous boards have reviewed and approved okay. these projects. Okay, so for the residential contributing individually designated property um, that had an addition or an accessory structure, we have three nominees. The first is 145 Northeast 6th Avenue. This is known as the Turner House. The second is 101 Northeast 5th Street. Um, the Turner House is individually designated. 101 Northeast 5th Street is in Delida Park, Historic District. And 106 Southeast 7th Avenue is in the Marina Historic District. So first, 145 Northeast 6th Avenue. Uh, I have it written as 2022, but I believe this was July 1st, 2020, when this was approved. Um, this garage is a, so it's a Sam Ogren home and accessory garage that had been altered and started to have um, decline issues that included a major crack in the foundation affecting the structure's um, structural stability. So the applicant came before the board and asked to reconstruct and do a historic reconstruction of the original structure. And this is the completed garage today. We, um, the owner has offered our staff to come and take a look at it. I'm interested to see how it turned out. So this is, this is exciting to see the structure has been replaced. The next is 101 Northeast 5th Street. This is an accessory structure to a contributing historic um, home. It's a, they used to have this um, outbuilding, which is somewhat like a shed, but it had garage doors on it. And they replaced that structure with this two-car garage that was done in a similar architectural style. The, um, Mission Revival architectural style. Next, we have a uh, three-car garage that existed on the rear of 106 Southeast 7th Avenue in the Marina Historic District associated with the contributing structure in the front. This was a garage that had been added years later, and the applicant came forward to the board and requested to add a second-story addition that connected to the main home. Um, the home front's on 7th, but this is the alley view. So we're on the west side of that structure. 
So those are our three nominees for the category of residential contributing individually designated addition or accessory structure. So I'll throw it to the board for deliberations. So first of all, I want to say, please keep doing this every year. I think this is, you know, I, I won't be on this board next year, but I think this is the most important thing that we do all year. I mean, it really, the opportunity to celebrate, you know, the, it's hard for, it's hard for us to appreciate what these homeowners go through I mean, just from the expense to the effort and everything to, to do these projects that, that we, we really do need to stop and, and celebrate them every year. Thank you for the feedback. We will continue to do this. We actually discussed this year, what if we didn't have enough nominees and we were coming up with some type of alternative to celebrate our uh, properties and homeowners and property owners in Delray Beach. Um, we did adopt a comprehensive plan policy a few years ago that said we need to continue with pride and pride of ownership programs, including an awards program. So we don't see this going away. Great. Could I, could I ask a little bit of the process? Um, the nominees were selected by staff. Is that correct? Is that correct? And there was a process for doing that. So we have a list of all projects that we've worked on. The list started when I started. So November 2016, and we go through the completed projects on that list. Um, some things that we can't bring to the board necessarily, and we're, we're considering an alternative program for our admin approvals. Um, we want to bring board approved projects forward, but we're looking at is there a possibility because we have had um, some admin approvals are Approval matrix allows for staff to have the approval of an addition that represents 10% or less of the building square footage if the additions in the rear or non-visible side of the property. So we've had a few of those and considered them. The challenge we faced was um, owners have changed and getting onto the property to photograph these improvements, have we, we couldn't bring those projects forward. And the decision process on our part is sort of majority rule, is that? Yes, sir. Okay. And the, the real question I have is, these aren't attempts, correct me if I'm wrong, these are not attempts for historical preservation or even restoration. It is, I mean, like the Allison Turner garage looks nothing like the original building. But, Actually, well, and that was gonna be my question. Is there anything original? In either of these, are they complete new construction? These are additions to contributing structures. So all three that we've provided for you were in the same classification. Um, these additions or, or accessory structures, Allison Turner's, I think, which is 145 Northeast 6th Avenue, the um, after does actually look like the original plan. So the, we have the black and white drawings. But it's not any, but none of the original is there. It's not a renovation. No. It's a? It's an addition or accessory structure. So okay. it's a um, both, they're all yeah. new. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't have to reflect the design, the footprint, the roof, the dimensions of the prior accessory structure. The, I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just no. Trying at the to time it was approved, that was deliberated on, and the 145 Northeast Sixth Avenue, 101 Northeast Fifth Street, all of those structures, 106 Southeast Seventh Avenue, all three of these had to take into consideration the existing structures, so that the board could make a finding that they met the requirements of the LDRs. So yes, they do have to take that into account with the approval. I'm sorry about being stubborn on this one, but they didn't necessarily have to be complete re reconstructions. I believe well, maybe, maybe for these awards, it's completely subjective, mm -hmm. and make up your own criteria. I, yeah, well, I I, I'm not. I I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just Chard trying to understand going. it. 
<laughs> the, I think you're struggling with the criteria for how to, you know, yeah. what, what I think makes he's it wanting the best. to know how to judge. Like, like, what, what are, what are we, what this are we is, basing it on? But this is just this, this is one of the really few times opinion. the board gets to have an opinion on something. Have an opinion. <laughs> That's that, all. So yeah, it's it's entirely subjective. Whichever, okay. make up your own criteria, whichever one you like the best, because okay. they're all great. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're all they're all yeah, great. They're all great examples. <laughs> I personally <laughs> like the 145 Northeast Sixth Avenue just because of how dilapidated what structure was before and. You know, we've seen so many times they could just tear things down or do whatever. So, in my opinion, the other the other two structures could have just been left. You know, they're they're not an eyesore. But the fact that it came before the board and you know wanted to to restore that or or make make use of it rather than just tearing it down and doing something else. I, that's my I vote for. This award is 145 Northeast 6th Avenue for that very reason. Yeah, I, I like that one as well, maybe just because of the simplicity and also because I can give my opinion. I just remember we gave Allison a really hard time when she brought this through. and She may have had to come through a couple times, but um, she got it done. Are we voting now? Yes. Oh, okay. The award ceremony will um, occur at the next board meeting. Well, I actually like 101 Northeast 5th Avenue, and I, I mean, I, I followed Allison's sort of, you know, long history with Francisco Perez and way, way back, and I'm just sorry that part of hers original couldn't have been saved. So that throws me over to uh, the fact that we didn't save any of that. It throws me to the total new construction, which is a great design of 101 Northeast 5th because there was nothing there to say that was historic. Okay. Well, I like the, the one on in one? the Marina District because they took what was there and they didn't tear it down and they didn't create a, a whole new structure. They took what was there and they added to it and embellished it and made it blend in better with um, mm -hmm. you know, the door treatment and the they Let's totally added to it. You totally added to it. They added a whole second story. Right. But they didn't tear something down. <laughs> well, she gets her opinion on this yeah. time. Yeah. So this is Danielle's all was personal. Torn down, I get my opinion. Yes. <laughs> so now, right now, we have three votes. Three. He each has a vote. No, I, I, vote? I voted for uh, the Turner House. Okay, so two. You guys aren't necessarily voting yet, but you're giving your yeah. discussion and your opinion, yeah. and then oh, it'll be a motion. Okay. okay. <laughs> Robert, what's well, your opinion? Uh, Taylor, I, I, I agree with you. When I Could you please you. use your microphone, Mr. Osnoff? I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to turn around. They yeah. can't hear you because the microphone. Yep, we can't hear you. Oh, you, get a sp you get to speak in the microphone, well, the Michelle. <laughs> it's on your, it's on your screen. Here. Oh, there you go. Can you go through them? I hate to ask it, you to do that. You should be on your right screen, on screen, too. Robert. Yeah. You can pull it on, up on the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> She's going through still, it, though, Robert. I'm still looking at the last house. I apologize. That's okay. If you tell She's me, going through it, tell me which yeah, one no, you'd no, like no. to look at, I will be happy to I'll put it on the right screen. now. There you go. Okay. Sorry being a drama queen here. Um, I agree on the 6th Avenue, the same reason that you had mentioned. I thought that it took some, I'm a big fan of, you know, rescue dogs and cats and <laughs> buildings. And um, it just seems like that, for some reason it reminded me of New Orleans. I mean, it just looked like something in a lower ninth ward. I mean, it just was in really awkward shape. And to take it and bring it back and knowing the history of how hard it was to do it, I thought they did a fabulous job, and I would vote for that one. They didn't take it and bring it back. No. Yeah, that was it's a total new build, they and it's double the size. They back in the sense that they <laughs> created something out of rubble, basically a relic. And, you know, that's what I meant. Uh, I would like to support Rhonda uh, because it does still have the same dimensions. Uh, the first floor has essentially the same design with uh, different floors. Uh, they, they did a creative reuse of the space. Um, 
I followed the travail of Allison Turner also on, on 6th Avenue and at one time tried to get that building moved uh, to Southwest. Uh, and I don't think there is one stick of that left. I think it's all in a landfill someplace. Uh, on number three, uh, 101 Northeast Fifth Avenue, I believe they basically used everything that was there and, and uh, as I say, made a sort of a creative reuse of it. Okay, so I think, I think y'all were all three for 145. So three takes. Well, I think you have to have a motion. <laughs> oh, we are oh, we're actually doing a motion. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll do it. Uh, motion to approve 145 Northeast Sixth Avenue as the winner of the 2022 Historic Preservation Board Award for the category of residential contri contributing individually designated addition and or accessory structure. That will be a sweet victory for her. We do need a second. Okay. Second. 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 Do we need to call roll? Yes, please. Yes, please. Kristen Finn. Yes. Robert Ostinov. Yes. Rhonda Saxton. Yes. Jim Chard. No. Buddy Willis. Yes. Ben Baffer. Did she call you? She yeah. didn't call you. She did not, but I vote yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm just the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so next we have the category of residential non-contributing. <clears throat> so we had two um, new construction on vacant lots on properties in the Delida Park Historic District. The first was um, 601, the first is 601 North Swinton Avenue. This is at the corner of North Swinton and 6th. And what was constructed is a two-story single family home that you can see here. They took their garage off of 6th Street, so they designed the front, even though the functional front door on this one is on 6th Street, they worked to ensure that the front of the house faced uh, North Swinton to preserve the streetscape. Oh, that's the streetscape, okay. Yeah, this actually here is the streetscape, which is um, landscaping has, is growing in, and you can see the front door there beyond. Oh, it's well placed on the lot? Yes. Oh, okay. There were no, um, I don't think there were any variances with this home. This met the requirements. The second one is 115 North Dixie Boulevard. And for those who maybe don't know this area, this property was this entire lot. The applicant had the house back here in the corner, which you'll remember that came through the board with Mr. Cope not long ago for an addition to that house but the lot was split. And so the west side became an ind a separate lot and the east side where the structure in the rear remained, um, and you saw that come through later. I should have noted on all of these, the construction dates, which I didn't, but like I said, they range from 17 to 19. So this house here, the owners came in with this new construction. This actually, this applicant was our only applicant at the time that had ever come in with almost a perfect submittal. So it was, she was really proud of that, this homeowner was. Um, but this is 115 Dixie Boulevard. And like I said, this is the lot split. So this is the new home that was con constructed on the west side of the lot and the other home is under um, construction right now with their addition. Do you have a streetscape? No. I have a few more pictures, or one more picture. That's the pictures we have here. This is Mr. Osnoff Street, actually. It's his neighbor. Yeah, that's, that was my question. Do I have to recuse myself? Recuse since, since, <laughs> no. That's okay. These are awards. It's... Do you have any ex parte conversations? 
I didn't know it was coming up. I did not know it was coming up, but I obviously am somewhat prejudiced. So these are the two structures that are before the board for their review. Okay, well, I'll go first, as always. I say uh, I like 601 North Swinton uh, because there are big homes on Swinton. So many times we are troubled with people trying to do big homes on tiny lots, but this looks like it had a large lot, and it did a large home on a block that, uh, on a street that has large homes. I like it. Well, this is also my neighborhood. Not, I'm not the neighbor of I'm Dixie, but I live on George Bush. So um, I walk my dog by these houses all the time. And if anybody remembers the 601 North Swinton Avenue, that lot sat empty for years. I mean, really, it was nothing like today's market. Um, and I always wondered, like, who's going to buy that lot? Who's going to build there? Because I was like, it's a beautiful lot, and I. Anyway, I like, I like that um, house and what they did with it. It's gorgeous. It doesn't stand out. It's very well placed on the lot. Um, That's what it looks like. But also, I'm very, really, really like the Dixie Boulevard house because I like the, I like the architectural style of it and the simplicity of it. It's a beautiful house when you walk by it. She has a um, really nice little porch swing and like a, I believe like a lime green front door that you probably can't see there, but um, it's it's really amazing. Both of these are, are great houses, and I um, I I know that that she's probably proud that she had a perfect. Almost, was it almost perfect? Almost, almost perfect. perfect. Yeah. Almost perfect um, submission. So I could be swayed either way. <laughs> I'm on this one because I think both of them, like you said in the last one, all all of these are should be commit. Um, you know, I think congratulate. The, I think the one thing, not to go off too far, but the history of the one on Dixie it, to me is fascinating. It was the original house, not this one, but the one that is currently under construction right now. That had been, I guess, in a sense, the gatehouse what was going to be this enormous plantation house almost. And then the 1920s hurricane came through and scared the living daylights out of the people who owned it and said, you know, no moss, I'm out of here. And they abandoned it um, and it stayed in this odd configuration, the house, that, not this one, but the one next door. Mm -hmm. So the only way really for the both of them to actually get to a place where you have two houses we renovated was to split off what became this, uh, the other house, and now the renovation of, 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 the, um, of the, the house that's, that's currently being renovated now that has gone through all kinds of issues um, over time. So the creativity of it, I thought, speaks a lot to it, although I agree with you that you know, Swinton Avenue and bringing back you know, a house on Swinton Avenue has great value too, but I just think that what they did here and what they went through to make it happen um, shows great creativity. I would vote for that one. Could you show 601 uh, Swinton again? Mm -hmm. And that's from the south East corner, looking north? Southwest. That's the intersection of Swinton and 6th. So South you're looking west. north, northeast. So the portion of the house that's here faces Swinton, and the portion that's here faces 6th. you have any other views of it? Mm -hmm. This is the 6th side. So essentially looking northwest. And that's directly from Swinton. I think they're 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 both excellent and outstanding. The uh, one reason I wanted to have a better look is is how much the garages predominate the design. And I think the uh, Dixie Avenue one, the the garages are so predominant uh, that they kind of uh, uh, outshine the 
the porch swing and the lime green door and the, that whole really nice, that one, yeah. Um, uh, really nice tropical feel. So I think by a very close vote, I would go for the Swinton Avenue house. I think I would agree with Jim for the very same reason. Yeah, don't we discourage front garage doors on the front? They are discouraged. Okay. Um, they are more and more difficult to design around given some of the sizes of lots, um, especially when we get into those 50 foot wide lots, which neither of these are, but it's difficult. Not impossible, as you'll see from 150 Marine Way, they set theirs in the back. Yes, but that brings me to a, a really a point I wanted to make. Next year when we do this, can we have a streetscape? Because it's very important. We can try. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we can try. And did you have an opinion? Um, I'm like you. I, you know, you either one would be great. I, I actually I like Dixie just because it's smaller, but um, you know I can't can't go wrong. You're gonna split your vote. That no. <laughs> Are we ready for a motion? I think so. I'm trying to move us along here. All right, I make a motion to approve. Oh, do I just put the one I want and it gets yes or no? <laughs> okay. <laughs> a motion to approve 601 North Swinton Avenue as the winner of the 2021 Historic Preservation Board Award for the category of residential non-contributing new construction. Second. Mm -hmm. 2022. 20, <laughs> I say 22. You said 21. 21. Oh, 22. You want me to do I did, did read it or is that amended? It's okay. okay. That's fine. <laughs> Kristen Finn. No. Robert Ostinov. No. Rhonda Saxon. Yes. Jim Chard. Yes. Claudia Willis. Yes. Benjamin Baffer. Oh. <laughs> I think we have a tie. We, we shouldn't be encouraging front garages on front doors. I'm actually, sure. you know, so it's a 3-3, so the motion actually fails. So um, if you guys want to try to make another motion and see <laughs> if Somebody that else. wins. Do we get Pamela Harris to break the tie? <laughs> well, I, I think I heard something from Ms. Sexton, which brings up an interesting topic that the board could discuss is, I don't know that we've ever encountered this before, but could there be a, a, an award for both, a tie? That's fine with me if you want to, if, if you guys want to award to both. Yeah. Um, you just idea. need a motion to Somebody award else make both the winners. My motion was to that. Y'all have to do okay, it. Okay, I'll make a motion. A uh, motion to approve both 601 North Swinton Avenue and 115 North Dixie Boulevard as the joint winners of the 2022 Historic Preservation Board Award for the category of residential non-contributing new construction. Second. That was presented so well, too. Who made the second? I seconded. Mr. Osnoff. Can we do, I was, yes. sorry. Robert Ostinov? Yes. Okay. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Jim Charm? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. Or the most I was just going to say, could, <laughs> could you do an all those in favor? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it already started. Yeah, so. <laughs> it did. Okay. So next we have commercial non-contributing. So these are new construction or exterior alterations. We have um, two for this category. 105 Northeast First Street is occupied and owned by Coulter Office. Coulter is a home builder in Palm Beach County. This is within the Old School Square Historic District. It's at the corner of First Street and First Avenue. Um, directly to the south is the Old School Square parking garage. The other structure is in the Delita Park Historic District which is owned and used by Dr. Hacker, a dermatologist in town. Uh, 230 George Bush Boulevard was a 
non-contributing structure that was um, completely and totally renovated uh, with the, I think they visited the board three times over the course of their project. So they added a second story to the building. The first floor has the office and the second floor has a residence, um, which I believe is, I don't want to say who lives in it, but it, um, I believe it's the property owner. So here we have a before picture. For those of you who may remember many, many years ago, this property was occupied by the Neal's Market, <laughs> which um, was demolished after the board had approved a plan for, I believe it was townhomes on this property. It was. That approval expired and was never constructed. Then the owner came through and amalgamated the property to the east, so the Hyatt Place Hotel, along with the property here, uh, came through the board the Hyatt Place is not in the historic district, but the board, I believe, deliberated on the entire site plan. So the Hyatt Place was constructed, and then there was a bit of a slowdown due to economic conditions at the time. So this half did not get built. So the applicant, um, with a vested plan, came before the board and asked for some minor modifications, which they got approved in 2018. And staff and the board both worked with the applicant to um, help them with their modification on the alterations, on, on the alteration of the approved plan, which changed the exterior um, of the building, and I think in a better way, um, over what was originally approved. So this is a two-story office building. It has the parking tucked in the rear. Some of it is covered. And that, I'm sorry, that is the west view. So we're looking at the northeast first street, I'm sorry, northeast first avenue side. This is the south view looking at the northeast first street side. 230 George Bush Boulevard, um, Dr. Hacker, you all will, most of you probably remember, he also has a building just around the corner from this that is an art deco design building, um, new construction. Upon completion of that project, um, Mr. Hacker came before the board to uh, renovate and add an addition to this existing structure that is non-contributing. It's non-contributing because it had been added onto so many times, which is what has given it that sawtooth, I call it sawtooth look to the exterior elevation. And this is what the board approved the sawtooth elevation was retained for the um, the, fir the first and second floor. And the second floor addition, like I had indicated, is an entire residence. The board also approved um, slight modification to the plan, which in in closed some of the parking so that they could have some garage spaces associated with the residence. The site included updates to the parking, the landscaping. Um, they have the electric plug-in spaces. I believe Coulter does as well for their vehicles. And so what you see here is the north side. This is the east side. I say north and east, but it's on a funny little um, wedge of a corner. So it's, it's, it's the east, but it's really the northeast. Um, you could see the balcony over there on, on the left that faces Dixie Boulevard. Okay. Are you telling us that 230 is a renovation, an alteration of the building in the picture? It's new construction alteration. Is there any part of that before in this? I mean, probably a slab. Or a I'm, I'm having a hard time with that, and I have to say, I get a lot of complaints from people who tell me the historic districts are dead, and they point out a lot of these buildings in Dell out of Park that all the, and yes, they're all concentrated in an area, the medical area, but that are so much out of scale to the rest of Dell out of Park. So I have, I'm having a hard time voting for 
things. Inter it, yes, it's interesting architecture, but on a, uh, to give a historic award, I'm having trouble with that. I might have people calling me. But I'm not sure. If I said my piece. Ask the question. <laughs> I think your question was: Is it an alteration? So there were walls that were retained in this um, project, but ultimately we included it in the new construction slash exterior alteration category because it does look like new construction. Okay. I would totally agree with Claudia. Uh, I, I think that the 30 George Bush uh, obviously is legal, it was approved, but it just changes the scale of that neighborhood so drastically. Uh, and. Uh, I think is leading to other buildings of the same scale and the same height, uh, uh, sort of peppering that neighborhood. Uh, on the other hand, the 105 Northeast First Street, I think magnificent architecture. I love the fact that it has high ceilings. I love the fact that it's got all of the windows. When you walk by at night, it just sort of glows. It really contributes to the sort of old school square uh, pedestrian aspect and um, and I think the fact that it brought jobs uh, in a leading South Florida company to our town has to be considered a little bit too. Uh, the fact that uh, they didn't just build a building to house employees but they really built it to be a showcase, at least in my mind, uh, in our commercial area. And, and it sits across the street from a lot of little one-story cottages, or just at the mm. end of the street, but I'm just saying. It sits well, across the street from a two-story structure, which is right. delivery dudes. Yes, but then there are the- And then there are one-story- the Other cottages, story. and the Bob Curry cottages, and the, the, the rest of the block. And then south of this is the parking garage, which is four stories, I think. Mm-hmm. This was a unique project in that it is OSHAD with CBD overlay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that CBD overlay okay. could have okay. encouraged an even bigger building. So in that way, now that we're bringing the CBD, I can find some reason to support 105 Northeast First Street. Well, and I, I mean, I can add the George Bush um, corridor because I, I live there. Um, this is like the, um, I don't want to say commercial dis like district, I forget what the exact zoning is here, but these are all where all, most of the offices and stuff are. I would love to see the, the places across the street get some sort of renovation because if you drive down there and you look some of the office buildings and dentists and stuff to the left, they're a complete eyesore, whereas- They're tired. This one, I mean, yes, it's massive, but it's also you have to, it's a doctor's office and the people going there for dermatology or plastic surgery, you know, are probably glad that they're going to a, a newer building and happy. And when I walk my dog, it's very, it's gorgeous architecture, whereas also the 105 but, Northeast. But, First but do you think it's gorgeous architecture, but it, to give it an award for, for historic well, it's award for commercial non-contributing new construction and exterior alteration. So yes. Okay. So when when the people across the street from that come and they say we we want to put a second story on or this or that, I mean, I I don't know. I just okay. I mean, I mean this me. again is just my personal uh -huh. opinion. I if I look at those two pictures and again I I live there and I I I see these buildings. Yes, I would I would approve. That. Yeah, you know who's going to I think who's going to call me. Yes. I, think, I, think, I think sometimes, and I noticed with some of the others, and I'm not suggesting that you're not a terrific photographer, but <laughs> the way you, the way a photograph is taken, sometimes it accentuate the size and scale. Well, this is this is a large. A big it is, but I do I do like the way they they stepped it back, you know, because they could have. <laughs> put it all to the front, you know, but they did like gradually right. do, what was that word you used? I used sawtooth. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, so again, the, the original building there you said was, was all added on over the years and 
right. jumbled. It looked like little villas put together with like a little breezeway or whatever. Like you don't really know where the entrance is. I think that was part of it too. The original building was a, you know, was a lot of a lot of different pieces that didn't come together in any cohesive form. Yeah. This this building, you know, I think both of them. Again, the problem is they're both, you know, for own reasons, terrific. But th this one is somewhat of a gateway into the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And when you look, to your point, when you look on the north, oh. <laughs> when you you know when you look on the north side of um, Bush Bush. There's a lot of the smaller buildings, and I think the whole thing is going some, through somewhat of a transition, but for some reason, when you look at that building, there is so much architectural detail that has a historic flavor to it or feel to it, or um, and it's very, very complex when you look at it. And they've done, a, I thought, a tremendous job of, like I say, creating a gateway into that neighborhood. It is commercial. Mm -hmm. Um, and, it is, you know, and there is no consistency from building to building. Well, and um, the north side of George Bush is not historic. Anybody knows that, if you don't know that. Like, okay. the George Bush is divided in half. So the south side is historic, and the north side okay. is not. I did not know that. Yeah. Or maybe that's part of it. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah, I, I just personally think that what they took, and w which was the original building, and the improvement of the new and the extraordinary um, attention to detail as you look at it more closely achieved what I think they tried to aim at, which was something that would you know, integrate into the neighborhood in a commercial fashion. Just one person's opinion. So I have to go with 105 Northeast first, only because I had the opportunity to see what was originally land for that site and I can say thank God the recession hit because if that had been built we, nobody would be happy with it. Well it is in a commercial district, it is CBD, it does sit across from the four-story garage, it is backed on the other side uh, on Pineapple Grove Way by tall buildings. Um, it's, it never really, well I guess it was residential in some, maybe on the other side of the street when you get down to Bankers Row but it's appropriate for where it sits. Well, I just want to tell you all that I was on the board when we allowed Neil's Market to be torn down. Oh, I miss Neil's Market. Because they brought in a plan that was, and after they didn't go forward with that, that is why we now have a demolition uh, situation where you cannot have a you can't just come in with a plan and say we're going to build this. You have to have the full site plan and everything has to be approved. You can't just say, oh, this is a sketch of. Um, so that was, Neil's Market is one of the reasons we have that demolition moratorium until we have the full site plan. Interesting. Yeah, we have a requirement in the code that says yeah. you cannot have a demolition permit until you've received your permit for your new construction. And that was that property. The reason why. And look how many years it's taken to build something there. It did. After they tore that down. Um, I ha I'm really torn between the two because I appreciate what Claudia is saying. You know, the, the uh, 105 Northeast First Street, it seems uh, very appropriate. And they've scaled it from the corner and they scaled it back a little bit going back down the street so that's a nice situation um, uh, overall it feels nice in the streetscape um, 230 George Bush I agree with uh, Mr. Ozanoff because I'm looking at all the details it's got a clapper uh, vertical detail and then it's got a horizontal detail their outriggers are beautiful, um, the, the larger uh, portion of that. And it seems like even the front door, they've gone with a uh, type of front door that feels more residential. And even though you can't see, there is an, um, an accountant, I think it is, that did a two-story building like right around the corner from this. It's, it's like a it. Key West look. It's behind um, it. So this isn't out of scale. I think. 
Dr. Hacker did a much better job here than he did on the first one. <laughs> so I would applaud him for that. Um, I don't see how you can say it's not out of scale. And I also would like to have just look at the one Secretary of Interior Standards that we could say they followed. Just one. I, I, I don't know which one he didn't follow. Well. But uh, what, what did they have to get? You know, I'm just saying, what did they have to well, get? For number answer? one, minimal change. For number two, I mean, you, that you was go not, down every standard. These are not contributing. Yeah, they're non-contributing. They never, they, you never had to meet a standard because they're non-contributing. So that's actually that's not, not true. true. You didn't have to keep that. And if, and that, and then that area, there's already all the buildings around there. If he built a one story, it wouldn't have fit in either. All the other buildings. All new construction has there. to follow. 4.5.1. Right. At, so what, and that includes Secretary okay. of Interior Standards. Okay, so what is it about that that doesn't follow? I think guys in the spirit of the award okay. process it might be right. more worthwhile to speak okay. about right. the, not, okay. not the merits you guys can what do it? what you like but um okay. maybe leaning Let's, toward the merits might be okay. more helpful in the analysis okay. these are our two choices so we should move forward with these motion do you want me to make a motion I'm going the wrong way, sorry. They were done so well the last time, I'm really reluctant to try it myself. Um, uh, I move that uh, 105 Northeast 1st Street. You gotta read. Oh, it wasn't up there before, sorry, thank you. Um, I move a motion to approve 105 Northeast 1st Street as the winner of the 2022 Historic Preservation Board Award for the category of commercial non-contributing new construction and or exterior alterations. Second. Kristen Finn? No. Robert Ostinov? No. Rhonda Saxon? Yes. Jim Tarp? Yes. Claudia Willis? Yes. Benjamin Baffer? Yes. I thought we were going to have a double winner again. <laughs> I missed who seconded. You didn't do that. <laughs> Claudia. Claudia seconded? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes our awards deliberation, um, <laughs> which was very spirited. Thank you. Our next we meeting. Concluded. Our next meeting is May 4th. Is it the 4th or the 5th? Anyway, I feel like I should double check that. Let me double check that it's the 4th. 4th or 5th? It's the 4th. Okay, it's the 4th. Um, so our next meeting, we will have the awards presentation. There will also be a social media um, posts that will happen through our public information officer. The, um, this will be our first one in person, so we will invite the award winners to come and receive a certificate from the board that both we're going to have to coordinate with you, Mr. Baffer, to sign the certificate in advance, and then the mayor also will be asked to sign the certificate. Um, so I have no other reports and comments, but please plan on being in attendance at the next meeting. And thank you for all of your commitment and time to historic preservation to the city and to this board. Thank you so much for all that you do. And watch for our social media. Like them, please, if you can, when you see the Instagrams. Happy National Preservation Month in May. Do you know if the Preservation Trust is doing them also? We are also doing our preservation awards. Mm -hmm. And I believe we have um, 10 or 12 and those are just ones that we like, and they're not necessarily new or fit certain categories, but um, you will see our signs in the front yards of the uh, winners. We have um, we created that last year for Preservation Month. Thank you, Claudia. 
I guess I, I want to apologize. I don't mean to be uh, too forceful. You know, the, the Secretary of Interiors is sort of my Bible and the scriptures that I make every decision on. And so um, sometimes things that were approved before this board or even things that are approved on this board, I might not agree with, but I don't mean to hammer y'all. So That's why you're here. Okay. We don't take it personally. I don't take it personally. I, I think every... I think you're doing a great job. And I, I appreciate I, I appreciate when we can agree to disagree, and I appreciate your opinion. Okay. And it was that's on what, that's such a nice makes, That's subject. what makes this board nice is because we can all communicate and come to an effective decision, you know, agree to hear your opinion. And you swayed me many, many times with your points, with sticking to the what we should follow. So I appreciate that. Okay. And your, yep. your, pad, your heart's in the right place. So. I think we also do need a Bible, and otherwise we kind of get lost in the fog of, of opinions. And to have somebody uh, be able to quote the scripture of the, our Bible, I think it's, <laughs> is useful. Well said. It's, it's a good thing it's the Secretary of Interior's Bible. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we in the comments section? Where are we now? We are board in comments. board comments. Don't ask me on the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will not physically be here uh, on the 4th and would hope that I could attend digitally. I'll be out in California, so um, I'd appreciate that opportunity. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, Michelle, if you can share with us the report that was done on and passed up to the city manager and then on to the city commission. Uh, with regard to preservation of the native in, uh, environment? I wish I had an update for you, but I do not. So we will need to go back to the city manager and um, see where that's at in the process. I think the city manager has passed it on to the city commission. Okay. I had not heard that, so thank you for telling me that. Glad to help. Um, is it, I'll ask our director to get an update from him and see if there's been any feedback from the commission and what will happen next. And if I have something before our next meeting, I will send an update to the board on the email. I don't th the commission hasn't seen it yet. It's been passed. I don't think it's been Yeah, I hadn't heard um, that. scheduled at I've all. I've been watching all the meetings. And I haven't heard it discussed. Any update on Chapel 4? Yes. Yeah, so they are um, making an application for their sign. The use we've had a conversation with them about the use and have to have another clarification discussion but they are um, operating as a museum with the ability to have um, events at their museum so it's not uncommon for museums that's to do nice. that I don't think that's the nice. sign um, what they did is they called the manufacturer or the sign maker who put this the last sign in and asked that person to create a new sign, but they didn't get permits for it. So I haven't seen the permit. I don't know if Katharina has. If she has, I'm sure she would come out and tell me. Um, but it will go through a review process, and if it's required to go to the board, we'll bring it to you. Okay. Is it, I mean, so the museum is still just an idea? It's not actually an open operating museum? I believe it's open and operating. It's yellow, it's oh, okay. Operating. Well, that... Okay, well, I might have to go over there. Uh, the fact that they're opening it up to events, that church served a lot of purposes in our community and often let us have meetings and different things there. So I think that's mm -hmm. historically what was going on. The, um, we spoke to the owner and they, she's got, it's very lovely. She sh we run virtual meeting and she showed us the interior of the space. They are working with plain air artists in the community and she has um, photographs and information on the wall speaking to the historic integrity of the building and when it was located in Boca Raton. So it's, it's very interesting. I have yet to visit. I should visit soon. Um, and if, if the sign comes before you, you'll, you'll see that as a COA. I don't know that it will need to um, based on the fact that it was a replacement of the same material that was there before. It just looks a little bit different than it used to. Aren't there parking issues there? No. For that use? No. So they can still use the parking lot across the street? The parking lot across the street has been removed from their property. 
they came in for a zoning certificate of use, which is our process that any time a new owner comes in to get a business tax receipt, we have to certify that that use is permitted in that zoning district. Um, the change in use from church to museum resulted in a reduction of required parking. So they're in compliance with the requirements for that property. And it's all on street parking? No, they have grass parking on directly north of the church on their site, not across the street. There's a little grass lot and there's some paved and grass on okay, the good. south side. I thought that building was originally on Southeast 4th Avenue. That building was originally on um, the base at FAU, which was the Air Force Base, and was moved to this location. Was the parking lot also rezoned? Nothing was rezoned, but the, or re the parking lot across the street, you're asking? Yes. So that, that is um, single family zoning. It was always single family zoning? Yes. It wasn't with, the, okay. Yeah. The church itself is CF. Okay. I went to an event there Friday night. Oh, you did? And I would just say that the, the owner has all the best intentions. She wants to keep it as a church, or not use it as a church, but use it for functions. Yes. Uh, she's got artwork in there from local artists. She's got a whole like Michelle says, she's got the whole history of photographs of that building of when it was moved in 1949. And I think that um, if anybody ever has the opportunity, they, they should, um, you know, Claudia, you should introduce yourself uh, to the owners. And, and May I uh, ask what your event was? Uh, it was a retirement party for Steve Toriello. Oh, okay. And so. Was it well, it was well attended or uh, was there was 150 people there and, and no um, parking issues. No parking or? issues. Mm -hmm. um, I parked in your driveway. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's the, okay. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have had conversations with the owner about the event space, which we are continuing conversations to make sure that um, she can remain in compliance with the requirements of the code, and I think she has some creative strategies. Um, to get people to the site that involve, you know, Uber or, you know, multimodal type of transportation options. So she's very forward thinking in her approach. She's okay. not looking to be a burden. She specifically said to the neighborhood at all. Great. And they have a website, chapel4.com. You can go. And, and it, what's the website? Chapel 4. Oh, Chapel 4. Okay. Com. The and number 4. Yes. And it's the number 4. Okay. And it shows the interior and all okay. the beautiful pictures. But they also had another event, Carol, um, that was here earlier from AGT Land. She's an artist. And they displayed all of the local um, artwork there two weeks ago. I was nice. out of town, or three weeks ago, and couldn't attend. But it was on social media. They advertised it, and it looked lovely. Okay. That's not to say there aren't issues. There are some things we need to address that I don't want to air at the public meeting just yet because um, we haven't spoken to the owner. But there are some things making sure they stay in compliance with their approval. So we're on top of it. Okay, well, I want to see him succeed. It's an anchor mm -hmm. for that block. District, more than block. Any yeah, other board comments? You, you can't be renewed in August? Why did you say you're not going to be on here next year? I'm limited out. You are? Four years. Oh, my gosh. Who's going to run the meetings? You have to elect a new chairman. You'll have to do in a new election. Yeah. I think there are a few, um, I think there are two to three of you who has a, have a 2022. In fact, I think, Claudia, your first term is up. Oh, it is okay. Yeah, it might not be. You need to reapply. <laughs> so everyone will have to be reappointed. Um, that typically happens in July with okay. the commission. So do we need to reapply or no? Okay. I don't believe so. Mm. I will double check because that may have come up. I would double check that. I double think check that they do, I, I don't they? Having to reapply. You know, I think you do because I think this came up with a different board member. I do think you need to reapply or something. I will check and email you all so that you're aware. Yeah. 
think that you do. So I do too. I think the last time the there. appointments happened, there was some issue with that mis misunderstanding. I'll email you. I think that's been a historical problem that people didn't know that they had to mm -hmm. be applying because they had their application and their resumes in, uh, and then it didn't come before the city commission, so they weren't appointed. Yeah, I think you're right. I'll I'll check and send you the process and what you need to do. Okay. Uh, what do our winners get? Just our, our recognition? Do they get a plaque or anything? They get a certificate. A certificate. Okay. Signed by the board chair and the mayor. Okay. Mm -hmm. And bragging rights. And bragging no, rights. No, no photograph with the. We've all um, heard, we've heard from all of the nominees and they are so proud to be nominated. They're all excited. So I'm, I'm sure they're probably watching. They watched maybe from home like they said they were going to. So I think it means a lot to them, the recognition for their work that they've done. Other comments? All right. Meeting adjourned. See you May 4th. Okay. Thank you. I like the new 20 minute, 10 minute thing. It gets gets us out of here. I know what I forgot, um, board members, just a sidebar thing. I'm really sorry I forgot to introduce him. This is Peter Martinick, and Peter has worked with the city for a long time. He's been in code enforcement. And he has now moved over to the development services team as the admin office coordinator. And he will be serving some of our boards in the same uh, fashion that Diane and Rochelle Siniscali does. So he will serve as a board secretary and also assist us in our efforts moving forward with digital plan submittal and, and other things. So welcome to Peter. Welcome. I apologize for not have introduced you sooner. Going to California. Um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>